Hi. This conversation includes graphic descriptions of sexual abuse that may be triggering to some listeners. Please take care while listening. Thank you for joining us for episode two podcast with my two filmmaking colleagues, co-director Kirby Dick and lead producer Amy Hurdy. Glad to be with you. Hello, everybody. Wow. Well, we had to cover a lot of ground in episode two, and uh, we really decided that we needed to look a bit more into who Mia Farrow is, because I think audiences, and we certainly didn't know when we started this project, very much about Mia. And as we know, the story as it unfolds, a lot of it revolves around her and who she is and who she was as a mother and her person and character. So I know part of our investigation was to sort of, you know, with a very open mind, find out about Mia's biography, present it, and also find out about who she is as a person and how people characterized her. So the episode, though, opens with this incredible video, this home video of the monster in the house. Kirby, can you talk about what you thought when you saw that video and why we all finally elected to sort of open episode two with it? Well, um, it, it, one of the things it showed me is how much fun the family had, um, you know, when they were all together. I mean, that to do something like that kind of project is really an undertaking. And I can just only imagine, you know, with Mia setting everybody up and making a movie like this, it must have been just really, really exciting and, and memorable. The other thing about it is, obviously, it's it could be looked at as an allegory for things that we were told was going on at the time. It's sort of an echo of that. Amy, so what did you think when you saw that video, the monster video? I think it shows a family that has a lot of love because you don't relax and play like that um, unless you're comfortable and completely at ease and love the people you're with. I mean, she put a lot of thought into it, you know, and that's kind of what we observed going through her house and in conversations with people throughout was that she did the crafts, the house is full of... The thoughtfulness, even the the house itself was just sort of this wonderland for children with the lake and the, she had animals and a garden. And I think that in a way, not only, as you said, Kirby, there were undercurrents of something much more painful, you know, and monstrous as we came to learn. So we went on to, in episode two, to sort of open up after the monster sketch with like a thumbnail sketch biography of Mia Were there any things, Kirby and Amy, that you felt like were really important to include in that short biography? And if so, why? I'm just curious. Or or any things that struck you as we were all learning about her and who she was? For me, the most important aspect of her biography, I think, was the fact that she had polio when she was very young. And, you know, it's particularly resonant now because we're in another pandemic. But the fact that she lived through that and survived and was living through it very aware that she could have been really physically damaged or even die. I think that is a is an important part of who she is. That's an important part of her character. And I think it shows the strength that you see throughout this whole story, throughout these three, four decades. A lot of that comes from living through that and weathering that experience. Yeah, I agree completely. And um the fact that she was came from a very large family herself, right? So she's used to, I mean, I know that I've heard anecdotally and I know that back in the day and even to this day, there was a lot of criticism of her who has that many children and there's something wrong. But, you know, she came from a very large family. She's used to that hustle and bustle. And then she was really affected by having polio as a young child. It unleashed in her this, you know, a bit of survivor's guilt. I mean, I know about that. My dad was a Holocaust survivor and many, many that survived often felt guilty. And then sort of their life was sort of driven by a compulsion to give back. But I sort of thought that maybe, you know, Mia's own trauma or her, you know, polio, what she went through with polio really made her feel like if I can give to someone else, then I'm living up to the responsibility I have, having been given the gift of life. One of the things throughout her story that's interesting is even though she's an incredibly accomplished actor, it it doesn't seem to be the central or most important part of her life. She really didn't ever let the children take second position. I mean, even we see in that footage of her on radio days, is it with Dylan is, you know, with her on set and the kids all describe that, which brings me to my next 
question or point that, and I think you said something really interesting in the last podcast, Kirby, about this strange mother misogyny that our culture has. Because when I look back on the way the media framed Mia and I look back on some of the comments now as this is coming out, that there is this recurring thing of, but she had so many children. Whatever you tell me, you know, there's something not right there because she had so many children. Do either of you have thoughts or comments on that? Well, I, yeah, no, I've, I've, I've thought about it a great deal. I mean, she she had so many children, but she also was helping so many children. She was looking for children who are in very difficult situations and reaching out to help them. Let's see what Casey had to say about her mothering. So how would you characterize Mia as a mother? Well, it was fantastic. First of all, she had uh, so many children. And I always noticed that they seemed happy. They were very well behaved. Um, when I had children of my own and I would go over, the older girls would move right in and help. You know, it's really hard to go someplace when you have a three-year-old and a set of twins, right? But I would go there. It was one of the few places where I could go. And the older girls would just scoop them up and take them off and entertain them and play with them, and we'd get to talk, have a cup of coffee, you know, that kind of thing. It was wonderful for me. She was, the household seemed very happy, very well organized. Um, I think she has more hours in her day than I do, because not only did she deal with all the children, but she had time at night to make scrapbooks and do all kinds of other things, you know, knit Christmas stockings, I think, you know, that other people just wouldn't do. And that impressed me very much. So I also wanted to play for you all a clip from Mia's sister, Tisa Farrow. What she, what she said in this clip additionally about the home life and what Mia was like as a mother is really interesting. Were you ever worried just adopting so many children and it was hard? No, because of the setup she created, it, I thought it was remarkable the way she organized it. Very organized person um, in general. That was even growing up, very organized. But she had it set up where she had to help around the house if she needed it. She didn't have full-time nannies, but she had a, a lady who'd come in. She had babysitters when the kids were really little, if needed. But primarily, she was hands-on. You know, breakfast was hands-on with her. She would cook breakfast? Oh, yeah, every morning. Um, For all those kids? I just want to reiterate here that if we had time and space, we could play testimony after testimony after testimony from people who are in and out of that house constantly, from nannies, from babysitters, from siblings, from everyone that we talked to's perspective and that we could verify and corroborate a very good, loving, caring mother in person. And the other thing I want to say that I want people to sort of, we didn't think about, you know, as they watch the biography that's presented in episode two, is that Mia had a divorce, a very abrupt, traumatic divorce from Frank Sinatra. He literally handed her papers. I mean, she got papers on the set of Rosemary's Baby. Is she vindictive? Does she go crazy? Are there any headlines about Mia saying anything hysterical or wrong about Frank? No. Cut to later in life, Andre Previn leaves her with how many children did she have at the time? I don't remember. Multiple children for her best friend. For her best friend. And what do we see? We see a video of him coming over. We hear the kids all saying, yeah, you know, mom never said a bad word. You know, he was incorporated in the family. I have only good memories. She seems to be very even keel. That's what, what you know, and, and through all this, through all this uh, drama, I mean, just the opposite of the way she's being portrayed. The other huge question people have asked is, okay, so why does she have so many kids? We sort of have answered that. Um, but why did she stay? Well, if you look at her life and the way her life was constructed at the time, she had her children and she had Woody and... I think when she felt betrayed, she went to the person who she loved to comfort her and to try to figure it all out. And that was Woody. She did love him. And she was also being told by the therapists who they were working with at the time that he was working on his behavior. And so um, she was being led to believe that everything was being worked through and that there might possibly be a way out for everything to work out. I think that's so true what you've said. And also, as we learn from experts, a lot of what you said, Amy, was who, who was left in her life. She had a very narrow, other than the family, which was an enormous, but she had a very small group, outside group. Let's hear what Carly Simon says about this. 
Woody kind of isolated Mia when he came into her life. You know, he, he so indulged her. He gave her everything she could possibly want. He flew her to places she'd never been. He took her to restaurants of food she'd never eaten. He gave her these great gifts. He promised the moon. And so when time went by and things cooled off, it was as if a prime minister or head of state had come into power and then the plague settled on the city because it was, so, it was such a disaster. Things exploded after the, after the honeymoon period was over. It didn't take long before hell set in. Wow. She should become a great songwriter. Oh, yes. she did. No, it was extraordinary. Like she talked extemporaneously like this poet, you know, like mm-hmm. um, you could see why she was such an artful lyricist. I, I never expected her to talk about this situation in terms of heads of state and plagues, particularly because we did this interview way pre-COVID. But what was so interesting to me about it was that she automatically and almost unconsciously equated this personal power dynamic to a much larger state institution, right? The microcosm of the power dynamics in the family or that she was witnessing, she immediately drew a line to the macrocosm of, you know, the larger power dynamics in society, Um, you know, with Woody suddenly being a head of state, um, there couldn't be a more economic unpacking of the personal and the public, you know, how the personal and the public are so intertwined and their lives were so interconnected that it was very hard for her to extricate herself or even understand how to begin to extricate herself from that relationship easily and readily and how also the greater institutions of society at the time and even still today reinforce that sense of powerlessness. Oh, I just want to add and that yeah. everything's complicated by the fact that he's her director as well. Oh, I'm so, so glad you said that. Yeah. Yeah, it just adds an, another level of complication and tension, creativity, uh, unpredictability, um, another entire... And economic and financial dependence. Economic and financial dependence, but I'm, uh, yes. That's interesting. I never thought of that, but yeah, I thought of it more in terms of he's her boss, but also how did that, how did her slipping into this role of being directed by him <laughs> all day on set, you know, what happens when you're off set? Does that somehow seep into the interpersonal relationship as well. I mean, I was struck in rewatching episode two the other night when she said I was old, I was in my thirties, you know, and my kids kind of like looked at me, but that didn't resonate as necessarily that off for me, even now having friends who are actresses and seeing what they have to navigate and all the social pressures still on women to look a certain way up until, you know, they're extraordinarily old. But anyway, so that's what really struck me about some of what Carly said. I think the end of episode two represents the huge disconnect that was evident in Mia's life at the time. Because at the end of episode two, we show that the adoption of Dylan and Moses became final in December of 1991. And then what happened a month later? She found the nude photos of her daughter, Suni, taken by Woody Allen. That says a lot about the disconnect in her life. Yeah, and that it all kind of came down on her, you know, over, I mean, that one year period of of her life must have been the most nightmarish, you know, I think anybody could imagine to have these things happen back to back. Um, Another question that people ask all the time and have always asked is why would she let him in the house you know, after she found those photos, because he was the parent now of three of her children, the, the legal co-parent. He had visitation. That's right. why he was there in the house. So glad you mentioned that. I want to play one more clip of Carly's, because this will really um, echo something that we're going to discuss later with Rachel Snyder. When you say isolated, what do you mean? He didn't like Mia to see her friends. So I was a part, I don't know whether Woody didn't like me or whether he just wanted to isolate Mia. I really don't know. But we, I never saw Mia and Woody together. And I know Mia has told me since that, that Woody had wanted to keep her to, keep her to herself and not have her relationships with friends. I I remember one time we had a date. I was, I was 
very good friends with Dick Cavett, and I knew Dick and Woody had a history together. So we made a, a date for the foursome of us to go to, for the four of us to go to Elaine's for dinner. And Mia called up like two hours before we were supposed to go, and she said, you know, we just can't make it. And later she explained to me that Woody didn't want to go to, out to dinner with me and Dick. I just still don't know the reason. I knew Woody before I knew Mia. Because as the Simon sisters, I was a member of, of a two-girl act, me and my sister Lucy. And we played at the bitter end, and we opened for Woody Allen. So Woody had us take notes every night. He would have us sit in the audience during his show and take notes as to what worked and what didn't. And it was really fun. I mean, we felt so important doing that. And he, and he was such fun. I mean, he, he was such a tremendous character. I, I was so struck by that, that I, you know, that she actually had a history with Woody and still he was, she went on to describe in the interview that he like wanted nothing to do with her. He wouldn't socialize with her. He'd barely look at her when they were in the elevator together. And I also want to say one, an, a, another thing that that clip made me think of was that um, I saw some, you know, people have asked, well, why just Carly Simon? And um, seems like you're just into celebrity and it's actually no, like what, what it's, it's part of the, what happened to Mia the pathology was, you know, as we were just seeing and describing as she became more and more isolated. And Carly was one of her few friends during this time because they just happened to live in the same building and their children were the same age so that they'd go up and, you know, into each other's apartments. Right. But so Amy, but the point is that when you went to look for people at the time, so we're getting a full story, that's who you could find, right? Because Carly was one of the few people that wasn't completely, completely, Mia wasn't completely cut off from. Oh, no, correct. Isolating a partner, a spouse, a loved one is often part of a strategy to allow yourself to have more control or power over them. And so that was so sad and poignant to me when we learned and heard over and over again from people. And Mia herself self-described that her life got smaller as this relationship progressed. You know, I mentioned earlier sort of how Carly intimated that the nuclear family structure echoes the larger patriarchal structure. And we see that in the ways she's talking here, right? It's all about him and her trying to sort of be a satellite and fit into his orbit somehow. And I remembered what else this reminded me of was that this language that she's articulating so well is echoed in Woody's language when he talks about Sun Yi. Like when he, I was just so struck by the passage in um, Apropos of Nothing where he says, here was a smart, <laughs> dynamic girl if only someone would pay her little attention, if, you know, just waiting to bloom. And it was like, yikes, it was so Pygmalion, you know, like I've discovered this hothouse flower. And finally, you know, I, her, her inner beauty will shine thanks to me and my attention. You know, this goes back to the concept of the muse, the concept that the master, this is a great gift to somebody who's young. You know, it's, it's just such an education, such an ex life experience that they would otherwise never have. And it's it's actually the giving is, it's a generous thing to do. And in fact, it's an extremely controlling thing to do. And, you know, the concept of the muse has, has always been this, this person who is extremely lucky to be in that position. And uh, uh, it's only now, I think, being questioned. And, and we try to question it some in episode two in the Christina Engelhardt section. And it's something that, you know, he, he celebrated in his filmmaking. Yeah, I mean, I think society kind of celebrated that, particularly in the 70s. That relationship was actually viewed, those kinds of relationships were viewed as actually positive, sometimes very positive. And the power dynamics and the potential for somebody being, in, you know, emotionally hurt or exploited was just uh, not even addressed, not at all. And so... The people, the, the people who are on the younger side of that relationship who are going through it are not only experiencing that, but they're experiencing that in the face of society who says, no, uh, you should you should be welcome this. You should be grateful for this. You are a very lucky person. Oh, I'm glad you said that because it shows Kirby like um, we look at these interpersonal dynamics and it's a reflection on how we all, as you said, we're, we're sort of groomed as well by the power dynamics we see in the films themselves. So we had that analysis or unpacking of the Manhattan clips and also the, the montage showing the sort of, <laughs> I don't understand what May, December means, but the, the large age gap, you know, relationships that seem to be a repetitive theme in all his films. 
May, December is uh, that the the man is in December. He's he's in the winter of his life. Right, exactly, and the and the young woman is in the spring of her the prime spring yes. time, right? But notice, right? That's such an interesting way of characterizing it because there's power is completely effaced. It's a calendar. There's nothing more innocent than a calendar. It's just dates and seasons, right? There can't be any. There, you know, so let's talk about it in those terms. It's interesting, and have that be the sort of palatable, you know, way of referring to it. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's very euphemistic. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the one thing I, I, I don't know. Maybe we should talk about is the uh, decision to utilize the tape. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to jump to. I wanted to say we're going to talk a lot more about the tape, a lot more in depth in episode three, but I wanted just to touch on it because it is the way we end episode two and it is such a harrowing thing um, to witness. It was a long deliberation about how to use it. Mia gave Dylan that tape that she made of her when she was seven talking about being abused and said, now that you're an adult... It's yours to do with what you will. You can throw it away. You can keep it. It's yours to decide. And so after much deliberation and hesitation, Dylan decided to let us see it. And we talk more about that in episode three. But Kirby, what did you and I grapple with and Amy Hurdy as well when we thought about actually using this in our series at all? Well, it was so um, painful I mean, it was so difficult to watch and it was so such a deeply personal and painful moment for me, of course, but really for Dylan. And you're seeing that and she's so vulnerable there. And, you know, we did discuss not including it, but we felt that this is Dylan's story and this is an important part of Dylan's story. And I think we we felt like we had to let the audience know you see Dylan being interviewed as an adult and you sort of abstractly realize that she's talking about being a seven-year-old. But I think there's something to seeing a seven-year-old grapple with this, discuss this, and and to realize that she is living this at that age. And the tape shows the basis of Dylan's account. It gives a clear explanation of her story and and what she relayed and what she would go on to relay many, many times after that. And that is exactly why it was so important for us to use it, because I believe if that case had gone to criminal court, that would have been um, a piece of evidence that would have, would have been used. Yeah, there's no question. It's very difficult to watch. I agree with you, Kirby, about it making people uncomfortable um, that seems to be the reaction that that some have had in terms of watching it, that it's so incredibly difficult to watch. It's so painful to watch. Which is why Dylan said, ultimately, you can use it because she hopes it helps other survivors hear her language and relate and feel less alone and helps parents and loved ones and caregivers and aunts and uncles recognize the language of a child and understand what, what to make of it and how to support it. We're super excited now to talk with Allison Stickland. Allison, as I mentioned, is one of the three people that was in the house at the time of the alleged incident. She was Casey Pascal's babysitter um, at the time, and the Pascal children had come to visit and play with the Pharaoh Previn children. And so Allison actually is a living eyewitness to um, what occurred that day in the house, and we're super grateful to be able to talk with her today. Amy, do you want to tell us how uh, we managed to connect with her today? At first, we thought her name was Strickland because we were told that her name was Strickland with an R. And so we were searching for a Strickland. So we were searching for the wrong person um, for quite a long time. And then when we finally got the court records and realized that her name was Stickland and Allison had one L. And Stickland is a very common name in the UK. It's like Smith in the US. And so uh, I literally spent the better part of two years trying to find an Allison Stickland in the UK and couldn't find her. Uh, finally found what was possibly a home address, no phone number. And I wrote a snail mail letter and dispatched it months ago and included my cell phone number in that letter. And it was a very cautiously written letter in case I got the wrong Allison Stickland. And I got a text message back 
just a few days ago. And two days the, ago, right? A few I mean, days our, ago. Our, yeah. The our day after. Up. I think yes. it was, yes, two days ago. Yes. Which is insane. I got a text message the day after we uh, locked the episode that had her testimony. <laughs> so I was just, it was one of those forehead smacking moments. And she said, um, I am indeed the Allison Stickland that you're looking for. And because I have a very suspicious nature, I immediately called her former employer, Casey Pascal, and said, tell me some things that only Allison Stickland would know. And she said, like what? And I said, just details that only she would know, like names of kids who played with your kids or details of things that you all did with your kids or where you lived. And she gave me several details. And so uh, I called the number that the person had texted me who said that they were Allison Stickland. And I said, so thank you very much for texting me. And I need to make sure that you are the correct Allison Stickland. So I have a series of questions for you. Uh, where did Casey Pascal live when you began working for her. Um, what was the name of the boyfriend that you dated at the time? His name was Vinny. And she's still with Vinny, by the way, which I thought was uh, sweet. And, and other questions. And she answered them all correctly. And so I said, you are indeed the correct Allison Stickland that I've been trying to find. Hi. Hi. Thanks so much for talking with us. I'm Amy Ziering. I'm one of the directors of Alan V. Farrow. And um, you've got Amy Hurdy on the line as well. Say hi, Amy. Hi, Allison. Good to talk with you again. What did you think? What did you think when you got that letter? And I don't know if you remember exactly what the letter said. Yes, I've got it here. What did it say? Um, it says, Dear Allison, I'm a producer with Jane Doe Films. And if you're the Allison I've been trying to locate, we're working on a project that your former employer, Casey Pascal, is part of. And toward that end, we would both love to talk with you. So what did you think when you got this letter? Out of the blue. Oh, my gosh. Yes. What a shock. Yes. You don't think, you know, something all those years ago is going to come back, yeah. you know. So, yes, it was a shock. I think that's why I was sort of like didn't respond very quickly because I was sort of I had to let it sink in. Understandably so. I sort of felt like I say I didn't sort of respond straight away because it had to sink in. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. After all these years, it's not something you expect someone to contact you all these years down the line. But I thought, you know, no, I, it's something I really need to do because, you know, if I leave it and don't, it'll, it'll probably eat away at me. You know, I should have done that. So I figured let's get in touch and, and, and see, you know, see what you want to ask and answer <laughs> As best I can, you know. Um, so I, I'm curious to ask, like, how vividly do you remember, you know, what it was like being a nanny for Casey Pascal and her children, and 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 what memories do you have of being in the Pharaoh household? Um, I I loved my time with um, Mr. and Mrs. Pascal and their children. Um, they were a very nice family. They were they were very good to me. And I enjoyed every moment of my time with them. Mm -hmm. um, um, Mia, we obviously during the summer months, Mrs. Pascal and her children would go to the house in Connecticut. And I would go down on a Tuesday and get the bus down and come back on a Thursday. And during those few days down there, we would often go over to Mia's because obviously she had a lovely beach and very kid friendly over there. So Mrs. Pascal's children would get together with Mia's children and just have fun in the sun, you know. What was your feeling about the household? Did it seem like happy, troubled? Um, no, very happy. No, I, I thought it was a lovely, lovely household. Lovely children. They all got along long well together. There never seemed to be any sibling rivalry. Um, the older children, like I say, had fun with the younger ones and was just no, very happy. No, I wouldn't say it was troubled at all. What did you think of Mia? Yeah, what did you think of Mia as a mother? Oh, I thought she was lovely. I thought she's very, um, like a very soft-spoken, gentle lady, you know, very attentive. You could tell it was so obvious she adored all of her children. And I just thought she was lovely. Do you remember the day? Can you set it up for us? Well, from what... I, from what I can remember, uh, Mrs. Pascal and Mia went out to do shopping for a few hours. 
and myself and Mia's two, well, her babysitter and um, this French, stu- um, I think, tutor. French teacher, tutor, yes, right. sorry, tutor. We were all at the house watching the children and Woody came on a visit. And at some point during the day, I went, I didn't see one of the Mrs. Pascal's children. So I went in the house to have a look and I opened the door to this small TV room and when I opened it I saw Woody on his knees kneeling down in front of Dylan with his head in her lap. You're in the house the children are playing everywhere there's a TV room and the door is closed? Yes all the children were outside playing there's like a climbing structure outside Um, but I went into the house and I opened the door to check in this TV room and it was Dylan and Woody in there and he was kneeling on the ground and he had his head in her lap and I just walked, you know, turned and went. Oh. Alison, how old were you at the time? Um, 20. <laughs> my math, sorry. Right, it's 65. So you were in your young 20s. Eight, five. I was in my, yeah, mid, mid 20s, yeah. So Mid to late twenties. What what went through your head? Oh, well, I was shocked. I thought it was very odd. I thought, you know, didn't know what to think of it. Really, it's not something you expect to see a father and daughter, you know, situation to see a father and daughter in. So you open the door, and you're expecting you're just opening the door because you're expecting just to see like what's going on in the den, what kids are in there, correct? Like what? Right? Is that why you walked in there? No, I went in there because I was looking for one of Mrs. Pascal's children. Ah. Because I didn't I didn't see them out in the garden playing with the other children no more. So I went into the house to look for Mrs. Pascal's child. Got it. That makes sense. So I just checked in that room because that's the room where some of the kids hang out hung out sometimes because there was a TV in there and toys. So I thought, oh, maybe they're in there, you know, watching TV, didn't want to play, so had gone off to maybe watch TV by themselves. And then you saw that, Mm -hmm. and what immediately goes through your head? Well, I just walked out and went back out into the garden. Um, I didn't really know how to react, but, you know, like I said, I was there to watch Mrs. Pascal's children, so I just continued to do that until they come back from shopping, and we went home. Was did did Woody realize you had opened the door, or did you sort of creep back out quietly, or you have no idea? Um, no, I didn't creep back out. I'm I'm sure he was aware that I'd walked in because I just walked in as normal because there was no reason for me to go in quietly. I was looking for Mrs. Pascal's child, you know. I just, as you would, just open the door up. Right. Uh, oh, my so, God. Yeah, so I just sort of pulled the door back shut and went up, back out to the garden. Do you have any recollection of what Dylan's expression was? She was just sat there. It's like when I opened the door, there was no, I don't recall any conversation or laughter. She was just sat there. It was just quiet, you know. Knight, how, how did you end up discussing what you saw with, with, with Miss, Miss Pascal? It was later that evening when we were sat down having dinner together and it had been bothering me, obviously. And I just felt I, I needed to tell her I couldn't keep that to myself. You were struggling with telling her, though, because you also didn't want to trans- trespass a boundary. I mean, tell me what, what your thought process was. Were you conflicted because you were young and, like, maybe you shouldn't say something? Or, Well, yeah, but then I thought, you know, it's not right. I thought I had to tell her I don't – it's like I wanted an opinion. No, was it, was it wrong? Was it right? It's uh, – it was very hard. I was just eating and I thought, no, I've, I've just got to get this off my chest. You know, I need to share it with Mrs. Pascal, you know. I mean, it so shook you that you felt it was like a burden that you had to get off your chest. So so you told Mrs. Pascal and how did you tell her? Do you remember? I just said that I'd over at Mia's that day, I'd seen something that was bothering me and she asked me what and I told her. Wow. And how did she react? I can't remember, actually. I think... I can't... 
I can't remember how she, I, yeah. I, I don't think we sort of went into a conversation about it. I right. can't remember if she said she would pass it on to me. I really can't remember the conversation I had with Mrs. Pascal. Well, she obviously passed the information on to Mia, which you would, wouldn't you, the child's mother. It's not something you'd keep from a child's mother. Right. And it just went from there, really. And then how how was it for you to have to go in and testify in court about this? What was that like for you? Nerve-wracking. But um, all I could do was go and tell the truth. And, you know, what will be will be us. All down to the, the judges and the courts at the end of the day, I just went and told the truth what I saw. And that was it. But... Woody insisted in his testimony that it was innocent, that it was just sort of a very normal fatherly thing. Do you think that's an accurate characterization? I'm not sure. Maybe from his point of view, he saw it like that, but I, it didn't strike me as normal behavior. You know, you don't expect a father to have his head in his young daughter's lap. So that's why it bothered me so much. But like saying, he obviously looks at it differently. But it's not just, you know, the kind of appropriate behavior you'd expect from a father, really. And then, but at the time, were you very also troubled about it, concerned for Mia, concerned for Dylan? Like what, what emotions did you have when all of this was going on? Yeah, I thought it was a very sad thing, you know, that this family had to go through all that. Very sad because they were, you know, such a lovely, happy family and it must have been awful for them. I don't know, it just it just struck me wrong. It's, it just didn't, I couldn't, you know, I just couldn't get my head around it really. It's, it's just not, I, to me, it's just not something you expect to see a, father and daughter position you know the position for a, a father to be in to greet a child like that is a strange greeting isn't it thank you we really really appreciate it thank you Allison. no problem i'm glad i could help now we're going to turn and talk to an expert and professor at American University. Her name is Rachel Louise Snyder. She recently wrote a book called No Visible Bruises. And her research and expertise is in coercion and coercive control. And so we really are looking forward to talking with her about just how that can happen in someone's home without them knowing it. So welcome, Rachel, to the podcast. Well, I watched both episodes last night from my on my stationary bike. I could not stop watching. It was crazy. Yeah. We're so glad you found it compelling. You wrote this book, No Visible Bruises, which is such a striking title. And we really were wanting to talk to you about, given all of your expertise in this arena, what struck you in this episode that resonates with all the research you've done? Well, the book really dispels myths around domestic violence and abuse. Um, what I try to do is deconstruct what it really looks like, for example, when a victim doesn't leave and why that victim doesn't leave. Gosh, that's so interesting that you say that because that's really a question a lot of people ask of men and women who stay in problematic relationships, even when there are clear red flags. So why, what does the research say? Why might people still stay in a relationship even when there's a clear sign of trouble? The first thing is that we do carry this myth that um, someone who's beautiful and wealthy doesn't have the same problems as someone who doesn't have, you know, isn't blessed or privileged with that sort of thing. I mean, you saw this, I think, most notably in the case of Nicole Brown Simpson. That was really one of the primary uh, events that got people to stand up and pay attention. All kinds of domestic violence advocates got into the field uh, when that happened, because they said, my God, if this can happen to someone who's, you know, rich and famous and beautiful, then it can really happen to anybody. So I think the first thing is to try to work really hard against the idea that just because somebody uh, has those those fortunes of fame and wealth and beauty, uh, that they can't also be a victim. That's true. That's really interesting. Um, this situation really could happen to anyone. It doesn't have to do with financial or processional status. It ultimately has to do with 
with gender roles and gender dynamics and, and power, right? Right. <laughs> yes. There's a reason. There's a reason the book is called No Visible Bruises. I mean, what victims will say is that the worst part of any situation like this is the way in which it degrades you. And part of that degradation comes, ironically, from the gender roles that, that society has set up for us, that women are, in fact, uh, a slightly lower status than men. And men who are very controlling uh, can play into that. So men can kind of capitalize on this innate structural power imbalance. So, for example, um, taking away somebody's ability to make decisions, right? Maybe financial decisions for themselves or um, decisions about their life, right? That, to me, is a matter of autonomy. You're taking away someone's autonomy, right? So this is another common thing that you see, this dynamic where an abuser will, will overplay their own contribution to the relationship and underplay somebody else's. And what I hear victims say again and again and again is that they, in the loss of their autonomy, they also lost confidence in themselves. They, they began to second guess themselves because they were being gaslit, right? At, at one point she says, you know, I kept thinking, like, was I crazy? Was I, did I see what I saw? And you find that again and again and again. But that is, that is a classic, classic sort of first or second step in a coercive control relationship. And I use the term coercive control because if it was a, a term coined by, by a researcher named Evan Stark who wrote a book by the same name. And I think it's been a real game changer because it finally allows people to name what it is. If you can't name what it is that's happening to you, it's very hard to get out of the situation. It's very hard to make sense of it. So coercive control is this invisible kind of control that one exerts, and it's incremental and not easily perceived because it happens slowly and via many different pathways, like... Isolation is, is one of the classics, and you see isolation in relationships that don't have... Uh, violence in them all the time. So you take resources away from somebody and resources might be things like friends, therapists, business associates, uh, and certainly finances. So you see this all the time, this isolation. And isolation can happen while it appears that a victim is out walking around the world. So victims of predators are often isolated and then they can be more easily gaslit because their self-esteem is so undermined. And that's because they start not to trust their own judgment, like we were just saying. And they're just completely dependent on just one person. What's insidious about it, or one of the elements that's insidious about it, in particular with the gendered roles, is that, you know, these are people who are not strangers to one another, who know each other, who know each other's weak spots. Oh, that's spots. interesting. So he has sort of intimacy capital. Absolutely. That's a really good phrase for it, intimacy capital. You know, there's, there's research that looks at um, prolonged domestic violence victims as having the same neurological brain makeup as prisoners of, of war, um, that the PTSD does the same thing inside, like, the neurological hardware of a person. Because they're not trying to control everyone around them. They're trying to control this one person or this one set of people. Thanks so much for talking with us, Rachel. That was really illuminating and I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to Allison Stickland again and Rachel Louise Snyder for speaking with us. As always, it was a pleasure to talk with my co-director Kirby Dick and amazing producer Amy Hurdy. I'm your host, Amy Ziering, and we'll be back sometime after episode three premieres on Sunday night on HBO Max, speaking with new guests and playing brand new audio tape that you can't hear anywhere else. If you like this podcast and you have a minute, please review it and rate it via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen to podcasts. You can also stream it on HBO Max. I so look forward to connecting with you all next week. Thank you for listening. Woody Allen denies ever having been sexually inappropriate or abusive with Dylan.
Woody Allen's therapist claims his behavior wasn't sexual as well. Woody Allen and Suni Previn were approached in December of 2020, and each was given two weeks to confirm interest in participating in an interview to address the allegations in this series. Their representative confirmed that the request was received, yet it was never responded to.